Hi, this is Rabbi Chaim Coffin. Welcome to our 44th installment of the Torah portion of the week. We're holding by Parsha's Devarim. It's the first Parsha in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Moshe's swan song, so to speak, that Moshe is going to give rebuke, seemingly rebuke to the, uh, to the Jewish people before he dies. And the, the Parsha starts off, um, chapter 1, verse 1. These are the words Moshe spoke to all Yisrael on the other side of the Jordan concerning the wilderness, concerning the Arava, opposite the Sea of Reeds, between Parn and Teufel, and Lavan, and Chatzeros, and the Zav. So the, the, the Parsha starts off by saying these are the words that Moshe spoke. He's on the other side of the Jordan um, concerning the wilderness and where he is. Right? So the, the different places that are mentioned, commentaries tell us, the different places that are mentioned are hints of the sins that the Jewish people did. So it doesn't say explicitly, but, you know, he gives them rebuke, seemingly, you know, in a, in a, in a way that is hinted so they understand, you know, what they did without, you know, without hitting them, you know, directly or necessarily embarrassing them um, in public. Now, it's interesting that the Torah says, El Kol Yisrael, he spoke to the entire Jewish nation, right? So it says, Mori Rebbe, Rav Agon, Ramosh, Sturmbach, Shlita, that he should be well. He brings down from the Vilna Gon, Rav Elijah Vilna says, that these are the words that Moshe spoke to the entire Jewish people, and he didn't make a distinction. He didn't make a distinction between the Kohanim, the Levim, the Israelites, the... You know, the, the righteous of the Jewish people, the less righteous of the Jewish people. He said to everybody, right? He's going to speak to the entire nation. So, one thing you see here, the Vilna Gon says, is you see tremendous togetherness, tremendous achtos. Moshe doesn't discriminate, right? Remember, when God gives the Torah, and he, sp and he says it over to Moshe, and Moshe writes it down. Moshe writes it down as God told him, but he doesn't distinguish. Right, he'll say these are the law. These are uh, people you're allowed to, let's say, marry or not allowed to marry. Um, if you're a Kohen, these are things you're allowed to do. You're not allowed to do, you know, etc. But you don't see, you don't see that he's speaking to the to, um, you know, about everybody. Because normally the Torah will say, "By the Ber Shem Moshe Lemo." Speak to God spoke to Moshe, and Moshe spoke to the rest of the people. So here, the Villagon points out a tremendous thing. That when it says to the entire Jewish nation, right, again, as the Torah says, that these are the words Moshe spoke to all of Israel, that the people were together. Right? There, there's there's a new a unique aspect. You know of that they you know they're they're not in individual or in groups they're all together as a nation you know imagine if there were no you know splinter groups or there was no infighting imagine what the jewish people would look like obviously you know because of infighting and other things that's the reason why the temple hasn't been rebuilt you know in the last two thousand years so when people do the right thing together and they're not split off one from the other, so that's an amazing thing. All right, so the one aspect of what the Vilna Gon says. And Mariah continues and says that it's specifically speaking to the entire nation. And each individual has a part. And each individual accepted the Torah according to their understanding. Meaning, when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, He didn't just give it to the Kohanim, He didn't just give it to the Levim, He didn't give it to the Talmudic Chachamim, to the, to the Rabbinic scholars. Everybody got the Torah. Everybody has a portion in Torah. Some know more, some know less. But each individual has a portion, has a portion in it, you know, according to the way God set it up. Meaning, God gave the laws to Moshe, Moshe passed it down, and now what will apply, you know, to women, 
you know, women have to do whatever they need to do. Men have the mitzvahs that they need to do, etc. But each person has a portion. Nobody is excluded. Now, there may be a hierarchy, right? The Koh the Kohanim, the tribe of Levi, that come from the tribe of Levi. Right? There are certain mitzvahs that come upon them that aren't coming upon anyone else. You know, amongst the Jewish people. And God chose them. Moshe is not the one who chose them. God chose them. And God gave them different functions, different things to do according to the way God saw that needed to be done. So, Kohanim have what they need to do. Levites have what they need to do. Men have what they need to do. Women have what they need to do according to, you know, according to the way that God himself uh, set it up. So, we don't discriminate over here. Just because people have different functions doesn't mean any one person is better than the other. Now, we'll compare it We'll compare it to a, you know, to a king that has many servants, right? And he has many people underneath him running things. Now, some people seemingly looks like they have more important jobs than others. But the reality is everybody's job is important in keeping the kingship running properly. In other words, you need everybody to work together in order, A, to pass laws, and to keep society running the way it should. You know, we'll give another example. You take a, we'll take a sports team, take a baseball team, got 11 players, right? If the pitcher decides, you know, I want to play left field, you know, I really wanted to play left field, even though, you know, he's a much better pitcher, you don't let him play left field because... He's a much bigger asset at what he does. So if each person who's who's the best, you know, at their ability and what position they play, you know, each person has a function. And with that function, depending how they play, will determine whether they're any good or not compared to everybody else. But nobody's saying, I want to be the manager. I want to do this or I want to do that. Each person has their set place. So if each person has their set plays, no one's thinking, oh, I'm so much better. You know, I do so much more. It's a team sport. You know, it, it's unlike, um, you know, it's unlike some other sports where if you have like a few good players, then they can, you know, uplift the entire team. Baseball's not exactly like that. You need a complement, you know, of players. You need, you know, you, know, you need people to hit. You need people to pitch. You need people to play defense. Right? Basketball, same thing. Even though you have less people. But you can have one or two people that are bona fide superstars that can carry the rest of the team. Now, sometimes they'll be more successful, sometimes less. But the idea is each person has a function. Now, if they go outside what their function is, it's going to be a detriment to the team. Why? Well, it's very simple. You know, someone who plays a, a skilled position, you put him somewhere else, he's not going to be as good. Right? He might be awful, actually. And he might cause the team to lose. So you don't want to put him out there. Right? Yeah, someone who decided that he thought it was a good pitcher. So, okay, let's put him out there. Right? So every five days he pitches. And he wins 20% of the time. Right? That's not very good. So, you're not going to put him out there to be a pitcher. He's no good. Right? You go according to statistics. You know, if he can't play that position, if I, you know, if he's not that good, you know, at that position, you put him somewhere else. I mean, if that's, a, if that's the only position he knows how to play, then, you know, you got to put him in the minors or get rid of him or, you know, season him, so, so to speak, to see if he's got any potential. You know, otherwise, if he does have potential, then he can fit in. With everybody else and help the team win. If he doesn't, and he's causing, you know, he's causing other problems, meaning that the team's not going to be successful. So either 
you know, he'll go to the minors, they'll trade him, they'll get rid of him, you know, they'll let him go, whatever the case is. Point is, not to get lost in the in the parable in the parable, that is, each person has their position. Right? In a government, you know, in life, people have different positions. People have different jobs. You know, you need people to do all kinds of things in order for society to function. Right? You need garbage collectors. You need, you know, people to give haircuts. You need doctors. You need, you know, there are plenty of types of people, you know, that you need. And each person is unique in what they have to offer. And therefore, therefore, in society in general, when everyone is doing what they need to do, and they're, and they're functioning the way they need to function, so society will function in a normal way. So, that may be a little of a, a jump here when it comes to Torah, right? But the reality is Torah is no different. That a person has their own portion, you know, they have their own portion in Torah, even though Moshe doesn't explain it. He, say, he, he tells the words to the entire Jewish people. Now, the question is how the people understand what these words mean. Now obviously we have a rabbinic tradition and through that rabbinic tradition which we call the oral law the, is a running commentary on the Torah. Without that we wouldn't understand anything. So a person's understanding cannot go outside that. In other words there has to be a set law there has to be precedent, precedent and there has to be a bottom line. It's permissible. It's not permissible you know, whatever the case is. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it has to be that they're going to understand however they understand. And if they have an issue and they don't understand it properly based on what the Torah says and what we do practically, so they have to work to the best of their ability to understand it. In other words, in other words, there's a certain premise that when a person learns and a person understands what the Torah says, it comes within a certain premise. And you can't go outside those boundaries. Why? Because if you go outside those boundaries, what happens, what happens is you go outside of what God wants you to do. In other words, I'm always fond of saying, and again, I'm going to patent this one day, and that is you cannot turn the Torah into a pretzel. There has to be precedent. There has to be rabbinic scholarship. Um, you know, it has to be within a certain within a certain framework. Once you go outside that framework, that's not called Torah anymore. So if you put, for instance, you put secular ideas in the Torah. We'll give one example. Right? I'm not going to go into detail, but I'll give one example. One example is this idea of feminism, right? of, of women's lib, so to speak. Now, feminism is a big thing that you know many people men and women are certainly a part of and that they agree with the ideal setup that women should be equal to men right when it comes to equal pay you know they should be equal so the question is the question is if we apply secular terms Right, let's see if this works. How does the Torah look at women? Now, many many feminists will say it's discriminatory. Women are sort of in the background. Women don't have an obligation to pray with a minion, with ten men. If they want, you know, if they want to pray in a synagogue, they're certainly allowed to. Right? Leading services is something different. You know, doing other public things is different. So these big time feminists will say that's discriminatory. You know, why shouldn't women be allowed to lead services? Why shouldn't they be allowed to be witnesses? Why can't they be rabbis? Why can't this, that, and the other thing? Now, the question is, how does the Torah look at it? Now, if, if, if according to the Torah, women were really discriminated against, as people say, right, as secular society will tell us, then 
the Torah shouldn't mention, or the Talmud should mention, that if it wasn't for the women, the Jews wouldn't have got redeemed from from um, from Egypt. If it wasn't for women, women, right? You had Esther who saved the Jewish people from decimation, from being destroyed. Women didn't participate in the sin of the golden calf. So if women were really discriminated against, as some people would say, maybe they'll call this apologetics, call it what you want, but why would why would the Talmud and the commentaries say this? They say, well, it's apologetics. Now, the, the question really is that, you know, we, we have to go to like, you know, deeper understanding, you know, of what this is all about. So, we'll make it easy. We'll say that men and women are created differently. Because if you were to ask, you know, big-time feminists, are there any difference between men and women? So these big-time feminists will say no. So, you ask the question a second time. Okay, let's think about this. Is there any difference, any difference whatsoever you can think of between men and women? Well, women can have children. Men can't. That's biology 101. Right? Women's bodies are different than men. They're different. Can't say they're the same. They're not the same. So, if they're not the same physically, maybe they're not the same spiritually. Maybe. So the idea is that women, men and women have different functions. If God wanted men and women to be exactly equal, then women would have to pray three times a day, go to synagogue, and it doesn't matter if they have kids, you know, they have little kids or whatever the case is, so they have to get a babysitter, they have to work it out. If God wanted them to be obligated in that, they would be. But obviously they're not. Right? They're, they're exempt from mitzvahs bound by time because they're busy doing other things, like taking care of their family, which is not a small thing. So then you say, what if I don't have little kids anymore? Right? If a woman doesn't have little kids, or, they, or she doesn't have children, so is she going to be exempt? She'll still be exempt. Because we, we go according to the majority. The majority of women marry and have children. So, if that's the case, then women should be exempt because, you know, all women, we're not going to make exceptions here, so all women will be exempt. You know, from praying with a minion, with, with ten men. So if women are exempt, that means they have a different function. Doesn't mean they're second class citizens, it means they have a different function. A different function means we can look at it by saying separate but equal. Or separate but different. They're different functions. You know, could those functions change? In theory they could. Right? You got plenty of women that work today because can't make ends meet on one salary. That may be true. But it's not the ideal. So, without going, you know, into much greater detail, everybody has a function. And the function is not always the same. Now, just because it's not the same doesn't mean it's discriminatory. Women have what they need to do. Men have what they need to do. They're different. So, people get this idea. You know, and secular society will beat you over the head with it. Over and over and over. And that is that, you know, why, why should women be in that situation? It's discriminatory. You know, it's a terrible thing. So... You know, either you have to say that women are the base of the family. You know, they're really in charge of the house. They run the house. Not that they're just our, you know, men, servants, and cleaning ladies. But they set the tone in the house. 
That's the way they're nurtured. That's the way their DNA is. Does it mean a husband, a man, cannot be more nurturing? No. You can train them. Right, but where is the natural inclination? Again, you can call this apologetics. You can call it whatever you want. I'm talking basically on a physical, a physiological, psychological um, plane over here. Women are more nurturing. It's just a fact. They're born that way. You know, you take little kids, for instance. You know, little boys are running all over the place. You know, bang, 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 bang. You know, jumping on things. You know, flying off the, you know, things. What a girl, you know, what do girls do? They play house. They have dolls. You know, they, they put dolls in a baby carriage there. You know, pretending that they're mothers. Why? So you say, well, you know, there are tom girls out there who play sports, do other things. Yeah, that's true. And they can do plenty of things. I'm not saying not. What I'm saying is, what is their inherent nature? You know, people say this is sexist. Again, I'm just saying on a physiological basis. What is a woman's inherent nature? Is it to be like a man? And to control and to be in the workforce like a man? Or is it be more nurturing? And is, is it, and it and it's, you know, to set the tone in the house. On a physiological basis, you have to answer the latter. That what they're here for, right, is to raise a family. That's, you know, without women, you wouldn't have children. That's not their only purpose. You know, but they're given reproductive organs for that purpose. To have children. You know, some may be more fulfilled some less fulfilled, but if they don't have children, you don't have a population. You don't have a next generation. You know, if it was given over to men to have children, you know, we, we wouldn't do it. Too painful. Other things. So that's the way God set up the world. You have a male, you have a female, and you have children, right? It's with animals. You know, it's with humans. But again, even within that, even within the family units, each person has their function. Right? When a person gets married, the husband has a contract, so to speak, that he has to uphold. Right? One of the things is he has to provide for his wife. Right? In physical terms. He's got to bring in, you know, he's got to bring in money. That's what he's got to do. He's got to provide. Now, some are better at it, some are worse at it, but that's that's what he has to do. Also, he's got an obligation to clothe his wife. He's got an obligation to conjugal what? rights. She wants to be with him, he should be with her. Right? He's got obligations written in the ketubah, in the marriage contract. Now, a woman can forego certain things. And she can say, I would rather have my husband sit in and learn and I'll go out and work, you know, up to a point, then when it comes too difficult, you know, if you have children, you know, it becomes more difficult, and then the husband, you know, is going to have to do something, eventually. Nonetheless, she could forego the husband providing, if she wants to strengthen her house spiritually when she's first married, to let her husband sit and learn, you know, get a stipend, maybe a small stipend, but... The house will look different if the husband is steeped in Torah, gives over to his wife, over to his kids. It's a tremendous thing. That's how most married people start off their lives. All right, let's rephrase that. Most married Orthodox couples, that's how they set up, set up their lives. That's how they start. It doesn't stay that way forever. Right, a woman's got five, six kids and four kids. It's, you know, a little bit hard, you know, for her to work as well. I mean, whatever, they work out a plan how to do it. You know, you know, and eventually the husband will go out and, you know, he'll have to provide. But again, the point is, without, you know, going into it in a much deeper way, because that's not the topic for now, I'm only pointing out that each person has their function. The functions can change to a certain extent. 
You know, a woman can say, I would rather you sit and learn for X amount of time, and I'm going to provide. All right, whatever skill she has, she'll provide. She can forego the husband providing for her. It's her choice. Not forced into it. It's her choice. You know, there are a lot of benefits to that. You know, but it's her choice. So, if she says, I'm not willing to do that, and, you know, it's too hard or whatever, so the husband's going to have to provide. But there are functions. Husband has what he needs to do. The wife has what she needs to do. They sometimes overlap. Right? If a woman's too tired, the husband has to help out. Right? He's got to help out. And she had a, you know, she had a tough day or whatever it is. And she's like, listen, I'm just too tired. You know, you deal with the kids. And you should deal with the kids. It can overlap. It's not a contradiction. But to see, authority can be delegated by both. But each one has specific functions, even if they're not spoken out. I mean, even better if they are spoken out. But the boundary should be clear. So this is a microcosm of the world and the way the world works. Because if each one has different functions in their house, that means if they do their functions the way they should in an ideal sense, doesn't mean it'll be perfect. What that will mean is that their, their house will function properly. If not, and there are issues, then the house could crumble. But there's a, a designation of roles and of things to do where if each person does what they're supposed to do, then everything should function properly. So that's talking about a family, right? A husband and wife, you know, for all intents and purposes, kids as well. So that's within your own small you know, close-knit family. Now, when you're talking about the world, you're talking about a city, a town, a country, a state. Right, went in a little bit opposite order there, but whatever it is, you need people with all kinds of different functions. And these functions are crucial in order for this state, city, country, whatever, in order to function. Can there be a breakdown? Yeah. Can things fail? Yeah. But all things being equal, if things function okay, then things continue. If there's a breakdown, if there's a breakdown in people doing things, or there's a breakdown in values, let's say, there's a breakdown in morality, then the whole place goes to pot. So you need everyone functioning together in order to make things right, in order to make things work. So we can look at the world and say, okay, some things are better, you know, some things are worse, but the world seems to function. You know, stock market's up, stock market's down, work is good, work is bad, people get laid off, different cycles in the economy, whatever it is. You know, but at the end of the day, when people don't do what they need to do, so the place itself doesn't function. And if it doesn't function, that's bad news for society. Right? If society doesn't function, you know, it's the end of that society. Or you got to, you know, you got to put a stop to it to make sure that it's going to function, you know, it's going to function properly. So... That I could understand, you know, with the king, with subjects, with the, you know, with the government. And each one has their authority, what to do, and what their function is. And it helps everybody else out. Now, you know, sometimes it may seem unfair. People seem to have, you know, certain jobs make a lot more money than the people who have more important jobs. You know, why should teachers be paid, you know, much less, you know, than, uh, you know, let's say than a lawyer than an accountant. I mean, not to say their jobs aren't important, but isn't educating our kids more important? Wouldn't we put it like way up here? We would. 
but they don't get paid like that. So yeah, doctors have an important job, no question. You know, they get paid what they get paid. <laughs> lawyers, lawyers are a totally different beast. You know, why they make so much money and, you know, whatever. But, all things being equal, you need everybody in order for society to function. So there'll be a hierarchy. Right? Of, of whose job is more important, so to speak. You know, within all that, okay, that might be true. However it's decided, it doesn't matter. Point is, is that everybody has a function. Now, when it comes to Torah, so when it comes to Torah, everybody has a portion in Torah as well. Now, what your portion is going to be and how you define it is up to you. Again, we're talking about within certain parameters. So if a person, you know, wants to learn more in depth, you know, cover less ground but learn more in depth about, you know, any Torah subject, you can do that. Some people lean that way. Some people, you know, lean towards doing, uh, you know, going a bit quicker, gathering more information, not sitting on things for so long, but you know, gathering information and understanding at a quicker pace. Other people may have more of a, um, you know, Hasidic side, right? They may meditate, they may go out to nature, they may um, sing and dance a little bit more, right? But again, they're within the parameters of what we're speaking about. So what's the point? Point is, is that everybody... You know, as is mentioned, that the, that the, the Talmud says there are 70 phases of Torah. It's not just one way, right, to understand the Torah. But again, I'm not talking about deviant uh, so-called Jewish groups, right? We're talking within, you know, a certain umbrella, right? And that umbrella is that God gave the Torah. The Torah is divine. Pass it down to Moshe. Moshe passed it down to the Jewish people. The Talmud is, an, is a is a commentary on the Torah itself. And the laws that we have and what we do are based on what the Torah says, what the Talmud says, how we understand it, and how it's brought down generation to generation according to the rabbinic scholars of that generation. Those are the parameters. So you say, well, that's pretty limiting. Okay. It is. Right? I never claim to be politically correct. Right? So those are the parameters, and that's what works. And the reason I'm using those parameters, A, is because I believe in it, and B, because it's the only thing that does work. Statistically, you look at four generations. What the fourth generation looks like in the Orthodox world compared to everybody else, everybody else is dying and, and, and dropping off the face of the map spiritually. The only, the only group that has any sort of establishment and will continue after four generations is the Orthodox. So, you can believe in whatever you want. You can bring me philosophical mumbo-jumbo up the gazoo. That's okay. I got big shoulders. I mean, not such a big guy, but I got big shoulders. That's fine. And you say the majority are, you know, are not Orthodox Jews. That's also fine. Right? You tell me what works. You tell me what's passed down generation to generation. And you tell me what you know, what the Torah is going to look like in the fourth generation. For everybody else, there is no Torah. It's gonzo. 60% intermarriage rate, even higher in many places. Total assimilation. It's nothing. Right? Pretenders to the throne. Not even pretenders. Not even, they don't even get up to bat. Because it's such an abomination of what goes on. I feel like doing it. I don't feel like doing it. Here Moshe speaks to the entire Jewish people. And he says, and he says, this is what God wants you to do. How do I know? Because God told me. So what happened to all this deviant behavior? Where, where did it come from? So there's an evil inclination. People have a choice to go one way or go the other way. So they say, well, don't they have a portion in Torah? Yeah, they have a portion in Torah made in their own minds. Torah made in their own minds ain't worth diddly squat. My language. It's worth a big F is, a big zero, a dime, nothing. 
because I'll make believe. You don't believe it's the real thing, you just give a lip service. You want to give a lip service, you think? You're going to you're gonna pass that down to your kids? Never happen. It's not going to happen. Because, they, because Torah, or Judaism without Torah, is like body without a soul. Right? God breathed in the spirit of life to people whenever a person's born. And that spirit of life is called the soul. That comes from above. Now, the soul is trapped in the body. So, if the body has control over the soul and it only goes according to the physical, basically the soul dies. It debases the body, debases the body and the soul. If the soul does what it's supposed to do, i.e., coming close to God through Torah and mitzvah, so it upl uplifts the body, uplifts the soul. That's the way it works. Nothing else. You know, so again, people can say, well, I have a different opinion. That's okay. You can have your, you can have a different opinion. But it's not going to really matter that much if it doesn't work. If it can't be passed down, who cares what your opinion is? Isn't that the point here? That everyone has a portion in Torah. Yeah, but once you veer off. And I think the Torah means like this. Even though commentaries don't say that. Talmud doesn't say that. But that's your opinion. They say, well, my opinion is just as valid as anyone else's. Well, let's take a look at the Karaites. The Karaites believe that the Torah, you're only, you're only allowed to take the Torah at face value. Literally. They don't believe in the, in, in the rabbis, you know, etc. So what happened to them? They disappeared. They fell off the face of the map. Right? There may be a handful of them left in the world today. They say, well, the rabbis usurped their power, and they did all these other things, and they pushed their agenda through. You can say whatever you want. The bottom line is also a mitzvah in the Torah, which most people probably aren't aware of, and that is, there's a mitzvah to listen to the rabbis. Ooh, but the rabbis are corrupt, and they do this, and they do that. Again, do we do what the Torah says or not? My portion in Torah is dependent on what the Torah says. It's not what I feel like doing. It's not a five-year option to renew. It's not like the Jews ate the same hallucinogenic mushroom in the desert. Sorry, maybe... You know, all the miracles in Egypt happened because Saturn was out of orbit. I mean, there are maybe some people that actually believe that. There's a theory out there like that. Sounds pretty ludicrous, doesn't it? I mean, sounds pretty pathetic. But people, you know, will hold on to that for dear life. Otherwise, you got to say, maybe the Torah is true. And if the Torah is true, maybe I have to change. Maybe my values have to change. You know, I remember having a conversation with somebody. You know, I was talking to a bunch of young people, and and the grandparents of this of these young people said, "Hey, don't convert them, don't change them." I mean, what they meant was, "Don't make them become like you." Now, this was a conversation about basketball, professional basketball. That's going to convince someone to be an Orthodox Jew? I don't think so. You know, then it went on to about movies and about entertainment. Don't convert them! That's not conversion. Excuse me. That's not even talking about religion. So what are they afraid of? What are people afraid of? They're afraid they're going to look exactly like you. All of a sudden, they won't, they, they'll stop ripping toilet paper on Shabbos. That's what they're afraid of. They'll be different. They'll start, you know, keeping kosher. They can't go out with you anymore. They'll stop watching movies. They'll do other things. You know, be a little more closed-minded, maybe. So when we say over here, everybody has a portion in Torah, what that means is within a framework. If you're outside the framework, that's not Torah anymore. Doesn't mean a person's not a Jew. Every, you know, a person's born a Jew, okay. You want to you wanna break your personal covenant? That's your choice. And everyone's got free choice. But it has to be within a framework. If it's within a framework that's destructive, if it's within a framework that, that abets 
assimilation and intermarriage. And says that, you know, we have to back same-sex marriages according to the Torah. That's not Torah. The Torah explicitly says you're not allowed to do that. So you say the Torah is anti, you know, anti-homosexuals. Yes, it is. It's also anti-pig. It's also anti, you know, having affairs. Right? Licentiousness. It's anti that. That's true. Torah never claimed to be politically correct. Torah tells it the way it is. Say, whoa, it's only the rabbis that interpret it. The Torah says don't intermarry at least a dozen times. What does it mean? Does it mean only for that generation? Does it mean only the nations and the land? What does it mean? Oh, you're a fanatic. Yeah, I know I'm a fanatic. Just tell me what the words mean. You want to give a lip service and say, that's not what it means. You understand what it means? You know, you, you have the breadth of knowledge to explain what it means? No, you're ignoramus. There's no mitzvah to be an ignoramus. You know, you can't read Hebrew. You never read the Bible from cover to cover. But in the in the absolute chutzpah, you say this is not what the Torah means. And this is, you know, this is apologetics. And these people are fanatics. And you know nothing. So the rule of thumb is, as I as they used to say in camp, when I went to camp, and that someone said something stupid, they would say, learn the rules, play the game, practice. Someone was, you know, someone was allowed to give an opinion about something they knew nothing about and, they, and act like they're an, you know, they're an authority. Only Jews do that. Right? Very few people, very few non-Jews, you know, do that. You might say, there are plenty of opinionated non-Jews also. Could be. But you got plenty of Jews out there, you know, intermarried, know nothing about their own religion, but have a lot to say about it. You know, again, a mule is a tremendously strong animal. It's a hybrid between a donkey and a horse. There's only one problem, sterile. Sterile means it can't reproduce. You veer outside the Torah and outside the way God wants it to set up, Torah will disappear. The Jewish people will disappear. And that's what we see now. 13 million Jews don't know anything about their own religion. More than a million practicing a different religion. Assimilation's rampant. So you say, well, they have their own portion in Torah. Really? That's Torah? You think Torah like that would have lasted the last 2,000 years? I don't think so. Up into the last 250 years, everyone was Orthodox. So now the reform is going to be the banner, or the conservative movement is going to be the banner to bridge the gap to the modern world. And say you can be Jewish, but you can do other things as well. Be part of the secular world. A little bit of Judaism, you know, more of the secular world. And we're going to make a hybrid. We're going to make it work. Show me it works. Show me in a Reformed synagogue how many people can read Hebrew. Show me in a conservative synagogue how many people can read Hebrew. And even if they can, do they understand it? They know what it means. They know where it comes from. They know what the purpose is. No! So why would I care they're the majority? You gotta disappear. And that's exactly what you have. But you say, but that's my portion in Torah. That's not your portion in Torah. Your portion in Torah is not to be an ignoramus. Right? There's no mitzvah to be stupid. The 614th commandment. Right? The 615th one is don't be a moron. Yeah, a little bit harsh. But people who don't know should talk, shouldn't talk. And if they're part of something that doesn't work, I'm not interested in your theories. What do I care what your theory is? It doesn't work. You know, a catcher decides he wants to be a pitcher. And he wins 25% of the time. You're not going to put him out there. Every five days, he's going he's gonna to lose. <laughs> he's going to lose, you know, four out of five times. Right, so if he starts 30 games... Right? You do the math. How many is he going to win? Not too many. After like five or six starts and he wins two, or he wins one, 
and he can't turn it around. He's finished. You know, there is an ability within Judaism to do tshuva to turn yourself around. You know, but if you're going to be on a team, you know, that the that the vast majority of players, you know, are batting a buck and a quarter. Team ain't going to survive. Not going to sell tickets. <laughs> no programs. They're going to go under because the team stinks. And they eat, they eat last place every year. That's not good for your fan base. Sorry, all you, you know, Cleveland uh, fans or maybe your Chicago Cubs fans, even though this year, you know, who knows what's going to be with them. Yeah, they look pretty good right now. We'll see. But if you're in the cellar year after year or close to it, no one ever thinks you're going to win. Just the opposite. You're a loser. Your organization's a loser organization. They don't go anywhere. They're an absolute failure. So then you're going to say, oh, but you have to look at the philosophy. We're planning for future years. And we're planning for this and we're doing that. Bottom line. Did it work or it didn't work? You're still in last place? Second to last place? Not interested. The last 10 years, you didn't finish high in third place. You want to tell me philosophy? You can't even sell at the ballpark. You're running a deficit. No, but you have to understand. It's part of the bigger plan. Again, show me. Lamaista. In practicality. It works. You still want to be a fan? You can be a fan. Just realize they're never going to get anywhere. Most likely. Depending on how bad the team is and how bad it's run. So the portion in Torah is the way God wants us to have the portion, but it can go in many different ways. We're not stuck just, you know, being one way or the other. There are many different ways a person can go within that framework. You want to go outside that framework? That's your choice. You know, leave your, leave your Hebrew name at the door. It's game over. You're finished. There is no future. Doesn't matter what your philosophy is. You don't tap into God's world the way He wants. It's just decimation. You know, we see what's going on. You know, in the Jewish world. You know, what Hitler, may his name be blotted out, killed the Jews and had thousands of millions killed by force. Shot them, gassed them, did all kinds of things. So what are we doing to ourselves? We're doing to ourselves spiritually. No one's putting a gun to our heads. But we're just throwing out Judaism like no tomorrow. Many people wiped off the face of the map spiritually might say, okay, so what? So what's the big deal? So okay, so they'll intermarry. No, not such a big deal. So they'll intermarry. But the end result is it'll disappear. So if you don't care, okay. So Judaism, will, according to that, Judaism will disappear. Unless you hold to its values. And the values have to be upheld the way the Torah sets down. Or it's game over. You know, I think the parable in sports is very easy to understand. You know, philosophically, is irrelevant. You know, in sports, the question is, where are you holding in the standings? Did you win? Are you in the top one, two, three, four? Or are you in the middle or at the bottom? And most of the teams are in the middle or the bottom. Anyone gives, you know, anyone looks at them? You don't want to go to their games? Of course not. They stink. Maybe they're a little bit better, maybe a little bit worse, but they're not going anywhere. So if they're not going anywhere in a physical way, and this is just a parable for sports, in the spiritual sense, all the more so. So, the Marabir mentions when it's told to the entire Jewish people, it means 
Collectively, we have the ability to tap in according to the way God wants us to. For men, for women, what children are supposed to do, how we're supposed to educate them, it's within a certain realm. If it's outside that certain realm, it's not Torah. That's Torah, my language. It's Torah made in my own image. It's too bad because God, God created man in his image. And we're making him in our own image. So I just want to remind people, I also have an intro to Kabbalah class every Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday night, 9 o'clock, New York time. Speaking about why God created the world, purpose of man. Now we're talking about free will and spiritual forces. Divine providence. I also give conversion classes. Uh, take a look at my uh, Facebook fan page, Beyond Orthodox Conversion to Judaism, or Beyond Noahides. I also have a, um, a blog, orthodoxconversion.com. Anyone who wants to contact me, feel free at rabbichaimkaufman at gmail.com, R-A-B-B-I-C-H-A-I-M-C-O-F-F-M-A-N at gmail.com. Wishing everyone a great Shabbos.